Newton's second law, that's F net equals MA, with friction. There's two general types of friction that we will be studying. Air resistance is a frictional force, and contact friction, friction between two things that are rubbing. So a frictional force is a force that opposes the motion of an object. It'll be a force vector pointing in the opposite, opposite direction of the motion of whatever object we're concerning. So it, it depends on, well, air resistance, let's talk about air resistance. It depends on two basic factors. First and foremost, it depends on speed. Speed is a big factor for air resistance. In fact, if you double the speed of any given object, the air resistance force goes up by a factor of four. Or if you triple the speed of an object, its air resistance force goes up by a factor of nine. It's basically the square of the increase in the speed. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Air resistance also depends on surface area. Or the shape of the object. One thing it does not depend on is the weight of the object. Here's one example, because you might think that weight is a factor, especially for falling things, but, it, but it's not. But the example I'm going to give you is like a van. Let's say we have a van, but the same thing would hold true. This is supposed to be a van. Let's say it's a van in two scenarios. Same van, same shape. It's the same exact van, but one time it's loaded with stuff inside. I mean, a whole bunch of heavy stuff inside and a bunch of people, let's say. And the other time it's not loaded at all. But both these vans, or the van in these two scenarios, has the same speed in both cases. What doesn't matter, really matter what it is, but say 20 meters per second. I'll just pick a speed. Same van going the same speed, but one's loaded, one's not. They'll both have the same air resistance force opposing their motion. Doesn't matter what the weight of the object is. Same thing is true of falling objects. What matters is your shape, your surface area, and your speed. All right, we'll come back to that. Then contact friction, friction between two things that are rubbing together. It depends on two things as well. Basically, it depends on the texture of the two surfaces. Things that are rough are going to have more friction, like sandpaper and so on. But it also depends on the force that pushes the two surfaces together. We, in physics, we call that the, on the, we call that the normal force. The normal force. Now, in math and science, the word normal means perpendicular, the perpendicular force. Now, here's an example of that. If you take your two hands and you rub them together, if you push really hard, your hands will warm up because there's a lot of friction. In that case, the force that you're pushing your hands together with is the normal force that I'm talking about here. The harder you push, the more perpendicularly you push your hands together and slide them past each other up and down, you'll have more friction. One thing that friction does not depend on, contact friction in general, is it does not depend on surface area. And we'll talk more about that in class. But texture and normal force are the big contributing factors to contact friction. Here's the equation for contact friction because we want to quantify get a numerical value so that we can do some specific calculations. Now for some reason in the, uh, in the conversion the subscripts didn't come out too well so I rewrote this same equation in red here. The force of friction F sub F is equal to mu times F sub N where F sub F is the force of friction measured in newtons F sub n is the normal force, the force pushing the two surfaces together. By the way, a lot of times it was, what it's going to be is gravity is going to be pushing the two surfaces together, especially things sliding across the floor. But I gave you the example a little bit ago about your hands pushing together. That would be the normal force, the force pushing your hands together, which you would control in that case. But mu, this is the Greek letter mu, mu, this letter right over here, bottom left, mu mu, it's a coefficient of friction. Basically it's a measure how rough the surfaces are that we're considering in a given situation. 
Okay, well, a couple things here. What are the units for mu? Well, if you look at the equation above in red and solve it for mu, what you would get is mu, and it looks kind of like a u with an extra hook in the front. Mu would be equal to the force of friction, F sub F, over F sub N. And if you look at the units here, the units would be newtons over newtons. So what happens is the units cancel out. Mu is one of those rare quantities that has no units. Another thing we have to consider with rubbing friction is static when the two objects are not moving. I'll give you an example in a minute. Or kinetic when they are moving. All right, let me show you a table of coefficients, and then I'll do an example problem. The table itself is probably pretty self-explanatory. Two things that are really smooth have low coefficients, like steel and ice. Static coefficient, mu, is 0.1. Lubricated metal, 0.1. Steel on Teflon, 0 0.05. Then the kinetic coefficients are in the second column. In general, these are somewhat, I mean, they're quantified as numbers, but they're really only good to one sig fig, even though we'll do our problems to two sig figs. I'll let you go to three sig figs, but that's probably not even a good idea. Even going to two sig figs, two sig figs in these problems is a little bit of a stretch. You can also notice here that the kinetic coefficients are usually less than the static ones. Not always, but usually. And I'll explain that in a few seconds as well. So here are some example problems to kind of put the, this all in context. Here we have a six kilogram block sitting on a flat table. It's a wood block on a wooden table. We want to push the block. Now if you push very lightly, the block's not going to move. So this is the, let's say this is the force of the push. I'm going to call it F sub P here in a second. But in addition to that, we also have, as we've learned earlier, we have the weight, the weight of the object, and you can calculate the weight as W, the weight equals mass times 9.8, but if we round off to 10, the weight here comes out to be 60 newtons. The force of gravity straight down is 60 newtons. And because we're sitting on a table, or a floor, in this case a table, the force of the table pushing back up is also 60 newtons. Now that force pushing back up we call the normal force. That is the normal force I'm talking about when we apply the equation force of friction equals mu times force normal. The normal force here is 60 newtons and the force of friction will be opposed to the motion. Now this thing's not even moving though but here's the issue this is the, and this is probably the toughest part of the frictional problems once you start trying to push the block and it doesn't move, friction becomes active. There's a force of friction that always opposes you. I'm going to call it F sub S, F sub F, force of friction. And if you push with a force of 2 newtons, friction will be 2 newtons if you're not moving. Once your force becomes bigger than the force of friction, not only will the block start to move, but it will accelerate. But if you push lightly, it won't move. If you, if you push a little harder, it won't move. If you push a little harder yet, so you're, con you're controlling your force, your pushing force. And we have right now, before it starts to move, we have a static situation. We have static frictional force. And static frictional force is interesting because it can build up and it can build up and it can build up, but it has a maximum. And the maximum is described by the equation you have right here, force of friction equals mu times force normal. So in this case, part A, what is the minimum force that will cause the block to slide? In this case, the minimum force, the force of friction, we'll look for the, the maximum friction, which is mu, wood on wood, and if you look at the table there, wood on wood, it's 0.5. The, the static frictional force, or coefficient is 0.5 from that table above, times the normal force, and the normal force here is 60 newtons. So the force of friction here is 30 newtons maximum. So let me repeat here. 
And here's the theoretical part that's a little bit tricky the first few times. If I push on this block from the side with a force of 20 newtons, the block won't move because friction will match that, 20 newtons. If I push with 25 newtons, my pushing force, friction will match me at 25 newtons. But the force of friction maximizes at 30 newtons. So I'm going to need to push with 30 newtons, or actually a little bit more than 30 newtons, to get this block to move. That's the answer to part A. The answer to part A, I'll do it in blue. The force of pushing, the pushing force, has to be, well, 30 newtons plus a little bit. Now, how much more than 30 newtons do I need to use to push this object? Well, how about 30.1, or 30.01, or 30.001? So here's what we agree to do. We'll say that the pushing force of 30 newtons is, is the force that actually makes the, the block start to move, even though it takes just a hair's breadth more than that. But how much more? Well, 31 would work, yes, but 30.1 also works. So we'll just say, okay, 30 is the break-even. That's when it will start to move, or it's on the verge of impending motion. So we say that's the answer to the problem. That's the minimum force that will cause the block to slide. Anything over that will cause the block to slide because you have excess. Then it will accelerate if you... If you go beyond that force, it will accelerate. Because once you beat friction, because static friction has this maximum value. But once the block starts to slide, then you have kinetic friction. Because it's harder to break it free because of the, of the interaction between the two surfaces in contact. Once you get it moving, the frictional force reduces to static friction, or to kinetic friction. And you can look at the table there. So let me do part B. In part B, the, the block is now accelerating, it's sliding, it's kinetic, and we have kinetic friction. So F sub F here, force of friction, now stands for kinetic frictional force. So the static frictional force immediately changes to the kinetic, which is a different value of friction now, and it's typically lower than the original value, which was 30 newtons of static friction, which was its maximum value. So we've sort of overcome that, now it starts to slide. We're going to apply newtons second law, F net equals MA. All right, so it's accelerating to the right because friction now has reduced. It's less than 30. So my F net is your big force of the 30 newtons minus the smaller force, force of friction, equals the mass, which is 6 kilograms, times the acceleration, which is listed uh, in the above, 2.5 meters per second squared. Double check the units. Make sure it's meters per second squared. So if you solve this for F sub F, force of friction, kinetic in this case, it comes out to be 15 newtons. Now it's not always half of the original force, it just happened to be that in this case. That's not our answer yet because we're looking for the coefficient of kinetic friction. It said, assuming we don't know what it is, it's not necessarily 0.3. So now we go to the force of friction equation. Force of friction equals mu times the normal force. We know our force of kinetic friction here now is 15 newtons equals mu, which we're trying to find, times the normal force, which is still 60 newtons. So we're all in newtons here. That's good. So mu will come out with no units, 15 over 60, which is 0.25. And that's our coefficient of kinetic friction.